<laughs> sure. Ask what me questions. What percentage weight do you have when you're bale grazing? What's that? What percentage weight do you think you lose? Zero. Zero, because you're recycling the nutrient value. I'm feeding my underground yeah. livestock. So, are you, but just setting that aside. I'll show you a picture where okay. I believe there's less residue left on the soil than if you grind hay bales and it blows in the wind. Hmm. And you're feeding a feed wagon. I think there's less waste on my soil than grinding hay, putting it in a feed wagon, putting it in a feed bunk. Well, you don't have all the flavor to do that. But there's still less hay, physical pounds of hay okay. wasted. I think there's less. I mean, I remember scooping feed bunks out of my uncle's yeah. feed bunks and all the waste that was around the edges and, and that they left in there. I believe there's less. And it's feeding my soil instead of laying around in a yard or blowing around in the trees or. I'd say even less than that. I'd say. Oh, that's what they say. So I say there's less than 10% on a 1500 pound bale. If you manage it correctly. Yes, less. So 50 pounds. Yes, Jim. No, this is mixed grass. What it is, it's old CRP. Um, the, the, what I'm going to show you today, we put in CRP back in the 80s, the brome has taken over it. So there's some western wheat, intermediate wheat, uh, alfalfa, there's some weeds, I'll be honest with you, they eat them. Um, but a lot, I'd say 80% brome. I do net wrap, I'll show you in this presentation, we take it off. We take it off. We, uh, I've thought of sisal twine. Um, I still think that gets in their gut. Uh, also, I don't want to sit there and wait for it to wrap seven times. I'd rather, I only wrap it a little over one and a quarter because I know I'm not going to be hauling them, right? All I need to do is hold it together to, together to get out of the bale, or the baler. Yes? Just to add to that, I got a buddy that puts just half of the twine in a, in a baler, cycle twine in a baler, and takes it out and feeds it. Does like three wraps or something with twine? Yeah, I've heard of that. I think it ties just as long, but Sure, sure, gotcha. Makes sense. Yep. Get a couple more in, man, and then start. Okay. Yeah, quick questions. How many how many bales how many pounds do you expect to get around the bale? I figured when I started I've always heard ten. So if you had hundred and fifty head you'd have want to have fifteen bales. But uh, through our experience of doing it they get like 25 around it. They'll, they'll pick out like the three or four best bales and they'll go to that and they'll eat like 80% of it. Then they'll go down the row and they'll pick out the next three or four and eat like 80% of that. Then they'll go to the last three or four. And then the last like three, two, three days they clean up. How many days ahead do you give out? I give five. So I put, uh, this is what's great about coming to these conferences. I, I move my wire Sunday morning and then I'll move it again on Friday. And they're taking care of themselves back home. I have 450 head of cattle at home, and I'm not doing anything. I'll feed this year 450 cattle for 90 days and not start a tractor in 90 days. Do you have any experience with pears? I have not done pears at all yet. Um, my next step on my soil health journey is I'm going to take a quarter of ground out and uh, um, do full season cover crops all summer long and just graze that. They'll be my harvest, cattle will be my harvesters and uh, then we'll have to, we'll have pairs on that. What was your question about that? Pairs. I was just, I did all the time. Cows, cows with calves and sheep last year together, you came there together and everything was good at that. <laughs> One thing I have heard with sheep, people have done it with sheep, want to use, you want to use smaller bales though, because they'll eat the bottoms out and the tip over and they will kill the sheep. So if you're doing sheep, make a smaller bale. Yes. With a bigger herd, move them less often. I think so. I think if you had less cows, you got to have a lot less bales. 
because you need them to clean it up. They can't go pick around. And I think that's what some of the stigma on bale grazing is. People would give them a whole quarter of ground with 200 bales out there and there'd be lots of waste. Where if I, you'll see in my slides, I make them clean it up and they know they have to clean it up. And then you'll see slides where they know we're out there reeling up the wire and they're standing right behind us waiting. And they, as we go with the wire, they come right across. Ready? Okay. All right. So formally, uh, my name is Van Mansheem. I'm from Clome, South Dakota, which is south central, um, south of Chamberlain, across the river, 20 minutes from uh, the Nebraska border. And uh, I operate man bull farming with my brother. Um, he actually lives in Brookings. We own it together, but he comes down and helps. Um, to give a kind of a recap on my soil health journey, I started, uh, we started no-till in 2010. And we actually realized that no-till, if you just do no-till, you can run into problems. And no-till is just a tool of the soil health journey. And that's why there's five soil health practices. And I kind of use the comparison, you don't fix a combine with a 9 16th inch wrench. You need multiple tools in your toolbox, okay? So we have a diverse crop rotation. Um, we've always been corn, bean, soybeans, and alfalfa. And in 2014, we added oats, and I actually love oats, um, not just for the commodity prices, um, but it's such a crop where you can do a lot more tools with it. You can add cover crops behind it. It's very micro fungi friendly. Uh, we have a goal on our farm to be 90% uh, gone with uh, synthetic fertilizers and chemicals. We started that in 2016. I'm down 50% in five years and have not seen any yield reductions at all. Um, we put cover crops wherever we can following a cash crop or before a cash crop. So we're using the rye after corn before soybeans. We're putting uh, big mixes behind uh, wheat and uh, oats. Uh, we have a hunting operation and we do a lot of food plots. I do like 100 different food plots. Uh, they're only an acre or two in size, but we used to just plant them straight Milo. Now I do a nine way mix with them just to have more diversity out there, okay? Um, I start do custom grazing on crop and hayland. Uh, my native rangeland, I do rotational grazing and paddock grazing on that. And uh, yeah, we do the uh, biological effective grazing on our rangeland. Um, whoops, wrong way. Uh, so we started bale grazing in 2019. And I'll be honest, you know, we all have, well, you hear us talk about we have mentors. My mentor in this bale grazing is Steve Kenyon. I started watching videos on him in 2017 and on how to do this because I wanted to do it. And what I was realizing, I, have, I don't own any cattle. And my uncles used to have cattle and they would feed all this hay. Where when I moved down to the farm, they got rid of all the livestock. And uh, so I haven't got any. But I started utilizing the uh, cattle as a tool back in 2013, just on my stocks and cover crops. But then 2016, I started realizing I'm putting up all this hay and I'm exporting it. I'm selling all my nutrients off my land. And I knew I could probably get by with it, but the next generations following me would not be able to sustain doing that. So I, that's why I looked into this bale grazing. And it's kind of a hot topic right now. You hear a lot about it. A lot more people are doing it. And uh, there's two main reasons that we do it. It's very economical and it's good for the soil and it's good for the land because you're not exporting your nutrients. So my biggest question is how to set up to do it. How many, and there's a lot of ways to do it. Um, and I'll just give, kind of give you guys an example of how we do it. So this hay is baled up in the summertime. We do it early. We try to do it by June 15th or so. And we just leave the bales out there. And then in October, we come back and we line them up in rows. That's a half mile. 
where the rows are in this left picture. Let's see, I got a pointer here somewhere, don't I? Oops. There we go. So we line them up in rows and see they're net wrapped. And I only net wrap them just, just so they stay together one and a half times, okay? And then we come back in October, or in December before we're going to put the cattle on them and we take off all the net wrap. And it's a, it is a two person job. Um, what we found what works best is we put a spear in one end and lift it up and cut it off and just take it off. And then we always row them up so the ends are all on one side, okay? And uh, then we use poly wire. The perimeter of this hay field is uh, electric fence or uh, high tensile wire. And then we section off each row with the poly wire. And what we do is we have two rows of pile poly wire. And so they have a row that they're eating and then we have two more rows set up and we do that on nice days. It takes about a half hour a row. And a lot of concern is with frozen ground. So we use these little plastic Gallagher posts and they just go into the end of the bale. And that's why we line them up that way on, its, on the side so we can go right into the end of the bale, okay? And so Sunday morning, before I was coming here to the conference, I just unrolled another roll of bales for them to have. And then now I'm going to be gone for four days. And then when I get home, I'll do another row. Okay. They're sticking into the bale. Yep. Right into the side. Yep. And then they come out real easy. You don't have to worry about frozen ground. Okay. Uh, just to give you an example of more setup things. This is a water hole up here. And this is how we used to feed. We started up here is north. This is east. We used to feed this way. We found out that with the wind, which is mostly north and west, right? When it blows, it blows the hay this way. And you get all this hay on this side, that hay would get on our wires and pull them down. So we started feeding from the west to the east. I added a water tank right here. So this is a row of bales with hot wire. This would be another row. And then they always go back to the hot wire. So I have like nine rows across here of bales. And I just keep moving it across and they just keep going back to water. Okay. Uh, we put in this Corbett water tank. I'm a big fan of it. Um, that's as much ice I had on it when it was 10, 10 below. That's all I had. And you just break it with a hammer. Um, these tubes go down into the ground nine foot and it just uses the earth heat to keep them from freezing. The valve, whoops, the valve is actually down below here. So it's like two foot, three foot down in the ground so it won't freeze because there's just enough warm air from the earth. No, not portable. You have to dig them in. Yep, yep, because they're buried nine foot. Yep. Uh, summertime, 50 head. Wintertime, 200 head. Yep. And that ball is just, that's the float right there. It's just on a string, and it works really, really well. I'm really happy with them. We've had them for two years, and I'm really happy with them. Um, are you just once, or are you twice? Once. We're, I'm in a 15-inch rainfall area. So you're, so you're June 15th. And it, yeah, and so if you have uh, any regrowth, they just graze they, they just graze it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they just nibble it off. Yeah, yeah, that's what's nice. It, I, I would recommend having more cows on it in the wintertime because it keeps it fresh and they're drinking all day. Yeah, but don't freeze up. Well, and are you using uh, well water or are you using rural water? That's rural, that's, that's rural water. Yep. Yep. So this is, uh, a lot of people have questions, when to move. When do you move them? When do you give them new hay? How much hay is their waste? This would be like two days before I move. I make them clean that up. This is when we move. There is very little there. It looks like there's not, but most of that is manure. And that circle's probably about, oh, 20 foot in diameter. But we force them to clean it up. That's not clean enough. That would be, I would consider too much if you want to call it waste. 
I don't consider any of it waste because I'm feeding my underground livestock. Okay, you have above ground livestock, which are your cattle, your below ground livestock, because that's what's feeding the soil. What's that? You said you custom grazed these cattle? Yep. You force them to. I mean, yeah, but do they lose condition? No, they're too fat right now. Really they're too fat. They, uh, we do put out protein lick tubs for them. I pulled them ten days ago because they're just too fat. Yeah. I did test on this hay two years ago, and it was like thirteen percent protein. You probably have to have more uh, supplement. And that's like what Steve does, Steve Kenyon. They'll let the sand through too. Right? Yep. And I guess maybe they don't clean it up as well. I don't know. But once you get them trained on this hot wire, it, all it is is single wire poly. And we have a solar fencer on it, Gallagher solar fencer, and they don't come close to it. I mean, they just, they'll, they'll, they'll clean it up. So here's uh, moving to the next row. You'll see on this first slide, this is my nephew. He's rolling up the wire. They're up here waiting. They know what we're doing. They're standing there just waiting. Okay? Then he goes by them, and then they come in, and they just come in and start eating. And they're just calm as can be. They are so, because we're out there with them. We're walking with them. They're so calm. They don't see a tractor all winter long. Okay? And then they are, they're grazing. And I don't know how many heads around that bale, at least 15, if not 20. But there's 15 bales in this row, and they'll start off and only eat about three or four. When I first started this, I was told to have 10, uh, a bale for every 10 head, and I have 150 head in this group, so that's why I did the 15 bales. But they only go to eat three or four. They like to be around together. I don't know, but so. We figure 40. Yep. Yep, which I know is probably high, but, you know, if we had a stretch of 20 below weather, they'd probably do it all, 40. And there's some uh, if we have, like, a, say, a stretch of five days where it's 50 degrees every day, I'll, give, I'll make them be there six or seven days. I, I don't move them on a time schedule. I move them when they have it cleaned up. So the big thing that we're talking about now is this water infiltration. And... Uh, this is some things that I was, the reason I started doing this was I was getting saline seeps in this hay field. And I had never fertilized it. So it wasn't because of fertilizer, like people like to say it's because of fertilizer. I wasn't getting water to go into the ground in the higher parts and it was running to the low spots. And then I was having a water management problem. And I was seeing cattails. And so I knew I was having an issue. How many of you people have use one of these rainfall simulator kits if you haven't get one they're free they're laying around out here in the hallways go grab one they're they're laying there for you guys to take and they're very easy to use and I'll just give a quick little demonstration you have this little canister here you put this in the ground you pound it in they give you wood so you don't bend it and then you use a cellophane wrap you put over the top you use this water, which is about a bottle of water, and you pour it on the top, you pull it away, and you just see, you time how long that water, that in, this, it represents an inch of water, and you time how long that it takes for that inch of water to go in the ground. When I first did this on this hay field, it took 42 seconds for the first inch. I did it last summer after we hayed, and it went in in nine seconds. Where I had bale grazed, in spots that I had bale grazed. And now I still have places out there that it's 42 seconds. But it's a really good, valuable tool to see uh, if you're infiltrating the water. And I was not. Yes? Are you working on a grid system so that you will eventually cover it? I'm not. What I'm going to do is uh, I have a drone, and we'll start droning and start looking. We can see, you'll be able to see the green spots where the bales were. And I know for the first, I would guess, 10 years, I'm just going to keep moving these rows into different spots. And then after I figure I got the whole field pretty well covered, then I'm going to start isolating and maybe put 15 in a spot like the size of this room. 
up on a, maybe a ridge or a hilltop where I know I need more organic matter and better infiltration. So, and I'm using these cows as a tool to better my land, okay? I've heard, I can't remember what speaker I heard, but he asked the question, are you working for the cows or are the cows working for you? And the cows need to be working for you. They are a tool, all right? So use this infiltration kit and uh, uh, watch your land get better taking in water. Uh, another reason I started doing this is because I was realizing I was mining my soil. I was taking nutrients from that soil and exporting it down the road. We were selling it, okay? A lot of people have hay ground where they take it into their yard and feed it or around their home place and feed it. You're exporting that nutrients from that land. And yes, a lot of people will replace it spreading urea, but people don't realize the other nutrients that you're exporting from that land. And you're never going to get it back, okay? So this is a way to keep all the nutrients that I'm uh, putting up in hay on that same piece of ground. And the prices I used was, this year I used like nitrogen, urea at 750, okay? So obviously it's higher this year than most years, but uh, who knows where urea is gonna be, all right? So think about that, if you're mining your soil, sooner or later, there's gonna be nothing left. Uh, then I'm, I got in the next few slides I stole from Steve Kenyon. I called him and asked him if I could put him in my presentation because he has a lot more data than I do because he's been doing it longer. And so he gave me the okay to do it. But the first picture represents on the left is a controlled area whoops, of where they haven't been bale grazing the grass versus where they have been grazing. And I'm noticing this where the bales have been, the grass is greener and thicker. The blades are much thicker, okay? And then he has uh, how much more revenue he able, is able to get uh, on biomass of grass where he's bale grazed in multiple years, okay? So the non-bale grazed, he had $43 an acre. Bale grazing after the first year, he had 47 improvement, okay? Then the second year, it goes down a little bit to 38, third year, 35, and fourth year, 28, because the cell, soil is healthier that it's not as improving as much. But you can see there, even after four years, it's still improving, okay? You start adding up, you know, take that times 100 acres, that's a lot of money, okay? So not only is there a benefit for the soils, it's an economic imp uh, uh, impact. Uh, so nutrient input, 80% what goes into the cow, or excuse me, 80% 80 of what goes into the cow comes out of the cow in the back end. Okay, so if you're feeding 40 pounds a day, that means 32 is coming out. Yes? Was that year over year improvement? Bale grazed one year and then didn't bale graze in that spot? No, he was doing that off a controlled area. Yes, yes, same spot every year. And he bale grazes a lot different than I do. He, he's got a lot smaller paddocks. So, I mean, he, he's just loading them up. He'll have bales three feet apart from each other. He'd have 50, 50 bales in this area. You know, they barely can walk through. So, and that's what I project I'll start doing once I go get over the whole quarter of ground is I'll start implementing some of those really high intensive areas. Uh, and he figured, I think he got this research from the University of Alberta, but it, uh, every day you bale graze is like 30 cents per cow of fertilizer that you're putting back onto your soil. And that was in 2012 dollars, like so it'd be probably double that now or triple. But, but he's also realized it's not so much the fertilizer, it's the water infiltration. I think he spoke about last night how he has a control area where he rolled out bales and then bale grazed. The first three years, they both looked the same, but then year four and five, where he bale grazed, looked better still, and where he was rolling them out was not looking as good because 
it was the, he's not getting the water infiltration where he's rolling them out versus the bale grazing. Okay. Right. Yep. Get more organic matter onto the ground, and it's a lot less expensive. Do you think there's much waste on that left, right picture? Yeah. Most of it's 90% manure. If you force them to eat it, they'll eat it. And what they don't eat feeds your soil. That's got to have, you got to have that mindset that you're feeding your soil. What's that? It's going to be a lot more spread out, right? It's not going to be as concentrated. But, uh, yeah, I guess I don't have the, the answer for that. Uh, let's see here. So here's a picture from Steve where you can see where he bale grazed in the middle where the dogs are at and the outsides where he didn't bale graze. That's after two years, the difference in grass production. And that's pretty impressive. I have not seen that yet because uh, I haven't been doing it long enough. And I don't concentrate my bales as tight. So I'll see spots like that. I didn't know I was giving this presentation out, so to take in more pictures this summer, which I will have next year, um, then I can show those spots of uh, where you just have triple the biomass probably, I would say. So that's all I have. Um, I have some questions from some students. Are the students here that ask these questions? Okay. Um, first question was, uh, how big of the area do I cover? And I, this is on a quarter of ground, so it's 160 acres. Um, but I don't think size really matters. If you have a 10 acre piece of ground where you need to uh, you know, try to improve the soil health on it. There's no reason you couldn't do that. So, uh, how does the grazing affect the water? Um, this infiltration is three times as good already. It, I mean, it's, it's made a huge impact already. So we're getting water to go into the ground. And that's really important. Um, another question has, why did you want to be a part of the soil health board of Board of Direct Soil Health Coalition Board of Directors. Uh, I just love this group. It's awesome. It's done so much for me personally on our farm. Uh, and they spread such a good message that I really wanted to be a part of it and give back and help teach other people. Yes? So on your bale grazing, you're setting up your water, okay? So you were doing 15 bales at a time and you were doing like 100 acres or a quarter or whatever? There's, a hundred, there's like 150 bales on that quarter. On that quarter, okay. Yep. So are you, you got three water points or are you? I have one. They, they come back. So they're coming back across that. Yep. Time. So uh, on the last row, they'd what, walk a mile? Yeah. Half mile back? Yeah. Yep. Yep. And I want them to walk. I think that's important. Yeah. So you, you've only got one water point. Yep. And that was down that south of that. Yep. Corner. And I did it because I also, these cattle also for most of so this group of cattle, they actually graze on my cover crops and stocks for uh, 41 days. And this year, they're going to be bale grazing for 39. So they're all, that's why I'm using that water when they're out, uh, out stock grazing and on my cover crops, too. It's a whole half section that they're on. Yes? How far they are? Um, they're roughly 75 feet, probably. I uh, he's got pictures where they're 10 feet apart. Okay. Yeah. So they can get around. Okay. He told me and then he'll come back the next year and put them in the, in the spot between the 50 feet and he does a 25 foot. So it's like a 25 by 25 bridge, but he skips the middle row and then comes back on the next year and puts it there. So, but like on this draw here, I'm going to isolate that. I'm going to put more in that draw because I want more 
organic matter to be left in that grow. Some of it's what your goals are, just like you said. What, what I've done is put them, like you had those pictures of the diameter of the, of the residue left. I wanted to cover the whole area so that I placed them based on what's left on that residue picture. And you saw that circle there. Well, then, you, you know, like you said, they're about 20 feet across. Well, then if you put your bales 20 feet apart, you should get a complete coverage if that's your goal. So next year, I'll have my line will be right here. I'll just move these over. Then the next year after that, I'll probably go back to this line and I'll move these bales maybe 25 feet that way. So I'm going to eventually get coverage. It's just going to take a long time when you're covering 160 acres. I could bring in more hay and have more bale grazing for a longer length of time. You know, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Yes. No, and I had that question last night. There's no reason you can't, but my theory is why introduce seed to cropland? You know, grass seed and, you know, personally, I'm trying to get rid of, rid of synthetics. So I'm trying to lower my seed bank. I use my cover crops to pick my weeds and to cut back on my seed bank of other weeds I don't want. So it'd be, to me, it'd be introducing different grasses to your cropland, right? But there's no reason you couldn't. Yes? Can you describe the, the process of um, the relationship that you're building with your person that you're going to do the contracting with? What were their fears of, you know, doing the bale grazing? Or were they like, oh, you're going to take care of my cattle, there's nothing to worry about? Or did they have some things like, I'm not so sure about this. How's it, you know, will they maintain condition? That was their biggest fear was condition, um, that they would have the condition. Where's like the emergency cover from storms and things like that? Well, on every quarter, I should have put a picture. We have tree strips. I have half mile tree strips, and that's what we use. And if I'm connected to my yard, so if I had to bring them in the yard, I could. Right. Do people bring up these things? They do. And that's why. That's it? We're going to stay here all day. Uh, I agree. There's tons of those concerns. But when I look at Steve Kenyon, who's in Alberta, he's north of Edmonton doing it, where they can go 20 days in a row at 25 below. Yes, they don't have the winds we do, but we can fix that. I mean, we can help that, right? Um, And there's a stock, this is a stock dam here um, where there's a lot of cattails around. There's a bank here that they can get out of the wind. I actually, this piece of ground did not have a tree strip in it. But down here is where I do my cover crops, and this has the tree strip. So if I had bad weather, I can go down there. But I just planted eight rows of trees on this west fence. Um, there was no cost share. It cost me $12,000, but I thought it was that important to get coverage out here for trees. But... Uh, what did I plant? Bunch of species. I, I just let my conservation district do it. I know there's, there's cedars in there. We plant lots of cedars. Right, but if we control that, that's a, yes. Right? Um, no, I do all the net wrap at one time before it freezes. The whole field, the whole field. yeah. So you'll see, let's see, where's that, that picture? You see how they've blown? They've blown some, but they eat that. They'll clean that up. I don't because I need to put my fence, my fence post in the side. So if you put them in the end, it's harder to put that. They always seem to blow like this top edge. And I'm using, a, I'm using a 64 inch bale, so it's not a huge bale, but it seems like this top edge always fluffs. 
but this all stays together pretty good. You know, I guess I can't, I don't know how much they're eating each day, but they sure as heck, their condition is just awesome. Just, just the function of having that protein in there. I mean, this picture was taken last week. They will eat to content. To me, stop, to me, they look fat. It but yes, I would not give them the whole field. That's why I only give them 15 at a time, because... Okay. Yeah, I have not had a bad experience. And actually, a year ago, Christmas Eve, I had uh, moved them to this spot and started put them on a new row. And the way we did watering was really goofy, and the way we had the fences lined up. And they and I was feeding from the east to the west, and we got a all, all we got was an inch of snow, but the wind blew 60 mile an hour, and all that hay landed on that next row of wire and that wire went down and they went into the other hay and I was gone for Christmas. I come back and they had a mess. It was just all tore up. But I re-put up the hot wire and I forced them to stay on those two rows instead of one row to clean it up. And they ended up cleaning it up. You know, Somehow they picked through it. I don't know. What do they say, 15 days usually after defecation, yeah. they'll go back on it? Yes. As far as a cash flow deal, is it a break even deal on taking an outside cattle that you're getting the benefit from the new Yes. Yeah. What I'm doing is, uh, I'll give you my numbers. Last year, I could sell hay down there for $80 a ton. I charged my producer $1.55 a day, which is $80 a ton. This year, I can sell hay for a no for at least $150, so I charge the producer $3 a day. Well, I sell, I charge him what I could sell it for, but I'm keeping, I'm trying to build my, my soil. Yep. And they, that's why if, I don't think that producer this year would have done it for $3 a day if he had to do all 90 days for $3, but he gets 41 days of stock grazing and cover crop grazing, which I only charge him a dollar and a quarter. So it's going to average out to like 220, which I think is doable. Yeah. And he's a big producer, and he's got, he had a kid go to college, and so, I mean, they're looking for people to help take care of their cows, so. And they're neighbors. I mean, they're, my guys that come in and graze are less than 20 miles away. So if I did have a disaster, I knew they could come and help, and, yes? Do you find a younger cow or a less aggressive cow in condition compared to the hierarchy one? Um, no, and that's funny this year because he threw in 20 heifers this year, and I didn't even realize it. I mean, I didn't look close enough that they were smaller. Um, and he made a comment about how the heifers behaving with the hot wire because they hadn't ever been around hot wire before. I'm like, you got heifers with them? I didn't even know it. But no, they look just fine. You know, I, I don't know if they train from the other cows that have been there. So, 